Having now acquired a clear understanding of the legal effects of reservations, let us now turn to the complex system of acceptance and objection to reservations. The matter is regulated by Article 20 and Article 21, Paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention. Without going too much into details, the system is as follows. Reservations that are not specifically authorized by the treaty should, as a matter of principle, be accepted by the other contracting parties. Of course, reservations that are prohibited by the treaty or that are incompatible with its object and purpose should not be accepted by the other parties. And the acceptance of an objectively invalid reservation cannot make it legal. The rule according to which valid reservations should be accepted in order to produce their effect is largely tempered by two rules. The first rule is that it is enough that only one other contracting party accepts the reservation for the reservation party to become party to the treaty and for the reservation to produce its effect. This is provided under Article 20, paragraph 4c of the Vienna Convention. The second rule is expressed by Article 20, paragraph 5 of the Vienna, Vienna Convention. Reservations are considered to be accepted by another contracting party if it has not raised any objection within one year of the notification of the reservation or its ratification of the treaty. Silence during 12 months means tacit acceptance of the reservation. Well, read together and combined, those two rules mean that if all the other contracting parties unanimously object to the reservation, the reserving state will not become party to the treaty at all. This outcome is, of course, very unlikely as all the other contracting parties must unanimously object. And this is very rare. What happens then if the other contracting parties do not unanimously object to the reservation and that instead of express expressly or tacitly accepting the reservation, some of the other contracting parties, but not all, object to it? Sometimes one party will object to the reservation because it considers it to be incompatible with the object and purpose of the treaty, and for that reason invalid. In such a case, we would be back to the question raised earlier as to whether this is a correct appraisal or not, and absent a court having jurisdiction to settle the matter, the claim relating to the invalidity of the reservation will remain unsolved. But what would be the effect of such objection anyway? And here we need to distinguish between two possible types of objection, irrespective of whether the objection is about the invalidity of the reservation or whether it simply expresses the discontent of the objecting state with a reservation that is nevertheless valid. First, and as provided for under Article 20, Paragraph 4b of the Vienna Convention, it is possible for the party objecting to the reservation to expressly declare that because of the reservation it opposes the entry into force of the treaty between itself and the reserving party. If that is the case, there is no treaty between the reserving state and the party making such objection to the entry into force of the treaty. Such an objection has a radical effect and it must expressly oppose the entry into force of the treaty. Of course, it does not prevent the treaty to be binding between the reserving state and the other parties to the treaty when they have not made a similar objection. So if B objects to the entry into force of the treaty because A made a reservation about Article 42, there will be no treaty between A and B but the treaty will be binding between A and C and also between A and D. And of course, 
the treaty will also be binding between B, C and D. Second, if the objecting state does not go as far as preventing the treaty from entering into force between itself and the reserving state, what is the effect of a simple objection? Article 21, paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention states that when the objecting state has not explicitly opposed the entry into force of the treaty, I quote, the provisions to which the, treat the reservation relates do not apply as between the two states to the extent of the reservation. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you think of it, this is not much different, and this is not different from the reciprocal effect of the reservation itself. The provision to which the reservation relates will not apply between the reser reserving and objecting states to the extent of the reservation. This means that if the reservation excludes a provision, that provision will not apply between the two states, which is exactly what the reciprocal effect of the reservation means. And if the reservation modifies a provision, it will also not apply between the two states, but only to the extent of the reservation. The two states will reciprocally be bound by the modified provision to the extent of the modification, and it will not apply between them for the rest. So one must conclude that under the system established by the Vienna Convention, a simple objection to a reservation does not prevent a valid reservation from producing its effect. In other words, the simple objection to a valid reservation has no specific legal effect, as it does not deprive a reservation from its own intrinsic, reciprocal and relative effects. The simple objection is just the expression of a discontent with the reservation, an indication that the objecting state would prefer that the reserving state withdraw its reservation. And under Article 22 of the Vienna Convention, the reserving state may always and at any time withdraw any of its reservation. As you can see, treaty reservations are a difficult and very technical issue. And let us now turn to a concrete example to make it less abstract. <laughs>